Okay, I'm here with Professor Sam Tsang and uh, we're looking at his book, Right Texts, Wrong Meanings. Um, great topic. What made you write this book? Well, my, my reasoning behind writing this book is, is from my upbringing as a Christian. I think I've heard the scriptures being quoted wrong quite a lot. Being quoted quite a lot. And then as, as I explore through scriptures, I realized a lot of quotations are wrong. I've been convicted by that. And, and since being a pastor years ago, I felt like when I was preaching through texts, there's a whole lot of things I've discovered that I've been taught wrong or I've been quoted wrong in the church. Okay. So what's an example? What's an example of a, a Bible passage that you grew up with and you realized hey, it doesn't actually say that? I think the most popular one could be Luke 15, where you have the prodigal son. And as I examined the form of the prodigal son story, I realized the other two parable, or the other two stories, really, there's only one parable. And my book talks about uh, it's only one parable, not three. And if you look at it as one parable, the other two stories actually lead into the prodigal son story. Yeah. And the real prodigal son is really not the younger son as I demonstrate in my book, it moves towards a different, uh, different conclusion. And traditionally in our churches, we only preach about the younger son, yeah. the love of God the Father. And I want to change that a little bit yeah. by being respectful to the form yeah. of the text. And I've done that throughout the book. Okay. Okay. So can you give us a hint about what it's about? Yes, certainly. Uh, you're talking about the prodigal son story? Yeah, yeah. Sure. And if you look at the story, how it's being formed, it's, it basically has the plot of you have a lost, some, some, something got lost, or someone got lost, and it's been found. The text clearly says um, he's been found, even though he came back himself, but the text itself says he's been found, and then, and then there was celebration. This, this happens in all three stories. Yeah. And then there's the twist of when the older son comes back. That's an addition to the other two stories. The other two stories don't have an older son coming back. And at that point, the older son starts talking to his father. And, and then the conversation keeps going. And then you hear that he doesn't really want to go in. Yeah. So, so he is really lost in the story because he hasn't gone into the house, yeah. per se, in the plot of the story. Of course, he belongs to the household, but he hasn't gone in. Yeah. Whereas the younger son has gone in. So the younger son is not lost any longer. So the found the sheep. They found the coin, they found the younger son. But, but where the is older the older son? son? Yeah. Right. And Jesus was addressing the Pharisees who had trouble with the sinners and, and all the other people that they do not like. Yeah. And Jesus is basically analogizing the story to the Pharisees rather than to all the other sinners. Yeah. Although the sinners are listening. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, why do you think that? Right text, wrong meanings. Why do you think people use texts out of their context? Why do you think people do that? I think the church has failed in its education, both in the Christian education as well as in on the pulpit. And many of us are too busy to bother checking our facts when we preach. Yeah. And, and I found that out very early on when I started preaching uh, every single week when I was pastoring. And that forced me to look at the text very carefully because I have to exegete week in and week out through books. Yeah. And I had to respect the context even though I didn't like what I was finding in the context. Yeah. Because it, it didn't gel with what I was taught. And I think that was the Lord's, Lord's awakening, awakening for me yeah. as a pastor. Uh, right after I got my MDiv, this is yeah. way before my PhD. And I found a whole lot of stuff I've been taught has not, has not been accurate. And I think that's important because we, we call ourselves evangelicals. Yeah. And we, we think that scripture is, is God's word, is inspired, uh, reveal God's character, and we also believe in sufficiency of scripture. But we pay lip service to those, those terms yeah. because those are, are political, uh, politically correct terms in churches yeah. or in theological circles. Yeah. But when in practice, in reality, we don't do stuff like that. We, we, we stick to our so-called traditions Yep. And many people don't understand this tradition at one time was not a tradition until somebody repeated it. Yeah. 
You see, so so traditions are should not remain unchallenged uh, by scriptures. Yeah. I think scriptures need to speak to our traditions. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the next question is, um, what is the what do you think the result is if you do use right text to wrong meanings? What do you think the result is for the preacher, for the church, uh, for people's discipleship, uh, for the kingdom of God? Um, why is this so important? Because uh, they might be saying, you know, we're talking about Charles Spurgeon before, mm -hmm. and he said a lot of great things, say Song of Songs, and Song of Songs is all about Jesus and the bride. Uh, and I remember, I think it was John Christostom who spent five weeks preaching on the kiss in Song of Songs, as if that's talking about our discipleship. Uh, is that, why is that so bad? It's interesting you mentioned John Chrysostom because someone just wrote something about John Chrysostom this morning in my blog about this particular uh, book. Okay. And you can actually find me on, on, I've been blogging about this book, the making of it, my concerns. What are the consequences when we misinterpret uh, the right text with wrong meaning. Because a lot of big name preachers in the past have done it, and people we look up to, and so people, a lot of preachers, young preachers like myself, who are pretty new, we look up to them. So, so what are the dangers? I think the dangers, the danger, the danger would be, um, the most, the most glaring danger would be a kind of complacent biblical illiteracy. That, that's the best way I, I, I can put it, probably the most gracefully. What I mean is people no longer think through scripture or let scripture help them think with scriptural reasoning. Rather they give meaning to scripture uh, or any scripture that is not there. I think that's highly dangerous because people think we're evangelicals, we respect scripture. If we truly respect, we respect scriptures, we should give it the meaning that it's supposed to say to us and to our people. Yeah. And when we use scripture to serve our causes, we're no different than the non-evangelicals who don't believe scripture. Uh, scriptures are the word of God and scriptures can do just about anything or do nothing. Yeah. I don't think we have that choice as evangelical Christians to do such a thing with scriptures. Yeah. So as much as I respect the fathers and I read them a lot, in Chrysostom I, I read a whole lot of his work that's quite amazingly good, yeah. even for modern standard. And not all of them good at everything. And in their time, they could only do so much because of the amount of information yeah. or the methodological or philosophical constraint that was put on them. It doesn't make us better. I think we are just able to have more information now. Yeah. And we can reflect more as a community because Christianity now has become a worldwide, uh, global, force yeah. in the great religions of the world. We, we can think together, and, and right now we, we can think a lot more richly about what has been said versus whenever these things were spoken. And these things were all spoken in context of their time. Yeah. And for their time, they were, they were great. But it remains that biblical studies as a discipline has not been very old yeah. in, in its modern sense. I mean, great people like Calvin and Luther, they have always been very consistent in their exegesis. If you think about how different they are from, let's say, people like Chrysostom, um, would they be considered liberal in their days? Of course. But were they truly scriptural? I think they were making their very best effort, yeah. especially Calvin. I, I still read Calvin and, and admire him a great deal. I, I call my first son Calvin. That's true. <laughs> not, not because of Calvin Klein, but because I just respect Calvin <laughs> so much for his influence. But, you know, I, I like to see ourselves as walking along the same line as the Reformers, yeah. who respect scriptures, who are humanists in our exegesis of scripture, but Christian humanists. Yeah. Uh, we know Calvin's a humanist. We know Luther so, goes so along. What is humanist? So today, the mm -hmm. idea of humanist is just someone who it's all human-centered. And mm -hmm. um, what what uh, what's your definition of humanist? There? I look at it from the uh, the perspective of the reformers. Even Erasmus was a humanist. People who study literature 
uh, for what they are and understand the surrounding contexts, yeah. uh, reading classical texts that, that would give a richer background to the Bible. Okay. And then we execute out of that, that vast information. And I think that's what Calvin tried to do. Yeah. And he's a man of the letters, and he, he's well-versed in law, he's well-versed in the fathers, he's well-versed in Latin, yeah. Greek, and Hebrew. And I think that's where we should be heading towards yeah. in our time, and we have such great amount of information and tools. Yeah. There's no reason why we don't do that. Yeah, there's no excuse. No, none at, none at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've just been preaching through Deut Deuteronomy. I'm just thinking about this just for me personally. Yeah. And uh, getting towards Deuteronomy chapters 27 to 30 and the blessings and curses. And we've got lots of issues in our church. And you want to you want to preach to people's felt needs and where they're at. And you get to a tough passage like Deuteronomy 27 to 20 to 30 and there's just curses upon curses upon curses and you want to preach the context and you want to do justice to it but you're also thinking oh, I'd really love to speak into this situation now um, but this passage won't let me in speak into this situation how, how do you go about as a pastor you want to connect you want to connect the biblical pattern, biblical uh, the Bible what's in the text you want to speak faithfully from what that's saying and you want to connect where people are at. How do you do that without jumping off to something unhelpful? Jumping off to what the passage is actually not talking about at all? That's a very good question because that question touches on one discipline I, I teach regularly. I teach more on preaching now than I've ever done before. In yeah. fact, the college where I, I teach now uh, on a part-time basis, I teach all the homiletic courses. And that is a great concern for me because you, you are really asking a question about how you bridge the gap between the text, the world of the text and the world of your audience now, pastorally. Yeah. Uh, for me, scripture can serve as an analogy of our situation. I'm not saying scripture itself is an analogy, but it can serve as an analogy because we are not the Israelites, yeah. right? Yeah. So we are somewhat like the Israelites in some ways, so we have to ask ourselves how we are like them and preach out of that particular context because how we are like them will be different in different church contexts. Yeah. And when you look at the Deuteronomy passages, these are corporate discussions, uh, corporate pronouncements for the entire community of Israel. Yeah. And I think it has a lot of implications for how we become the church or how we express ourselves as the people of God and when we start finding the commonalities, I think that's where the text meets the preacher and the pulpit and the, and the listener, modern yeah. listener. Yeah. And, and we have to be quite careful about the kind of illustrations we use. I, I, I'm always talking with my students about illustrations because illustrations themselves can run away from us. Because yeah. that's where we bridge the gap between the text and, and the audience. Yeah. And the closer we can find the illustration being similar to them, and similar to the text, at every level, would probably be the best illustrations. So I'm fairly selective about the kind of illustrations I use. Yeah. And when we use those illustrations, they must speak both to the text and to the audience. Yeah. That's a big issue, isn't it? Because absolutely. Find, I think I, I find, generally, gone, having gone through seminary, I can do the exegetical part. I, I can do that. Um, I can work through the, the hermeneutics and see the biblical theology links and see how it leads to Jesus through the cross. But then to shape it for the here and now and the illustrations, that's just a really hard part. And I find that that's where I often, if, I, if I'm more, always prone to making a mistake in my fallibility, but that's, where, that's one of the, the illustrations are often where I go off tangent. And then the illustration if I get a bad illustration and, and I doggedly stick to it, mm. then that shapes my, my next point. Yes. And I go into the wrong place there as well. So poor, poor use of illustration for me, I found unhelpful. It's, it's dangerous. Yes, I, I think preachers, we are pragmatic. We want to move our audience. We yeah. want to touch them emotionally. And yeah. sometimes the illustrations sort of rule over us rather than we, we put it under the 
the lordship of Jesus Christ or for the um, you know the sovereignty of the text. Yeah, it rules over the text. Yes, it and it shapes. If you've got a good illustration, that can shape the text. So uh, sometimes, it, you know, you might even in your next book, you might say, um, "Right texts, wrong stories." <laughs> no, I'm yeah, joking. I, I, I can think about that. You know, uh, thinking about other ways to, <laughs> yeah. to talk about this because it's important. Um, one of my questions: You've got a lot of. New Testament, this is all New Testament, so you've got lots of good gospel ones in narrative, in letters, uh, in apocalyptic. Yep. Um, would you ever consider doing um, right text, wrong meanings, Old Testament version? I have done two volumes in Chinese. On the Old Testament? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm going to transfer it to English simply because I'm writing on so many different English projects. Yeah. Uh, I think if we can get people to think along certain lines, as we have done here with the New Testament, they would go a long way in also reading the Old Testament, okay. I believe. I think there, there are certain principles that people violate continuously. Some, an example would be, where does the story begin? Where does the story begin? If you read a story of, let's say, the, the prodigal son, it actually begins in chapter 14. It doesn't end until chapter 17. Okay. So without understanding the, the entire context, the prodigal son story remains in the story of the prodigal son. But that's a problem of wrong division of how we look at the Bible. We have to be quite aware of how we divide it. Yeah. And I actually dealt with uh, the prodigal son and then after the prodigal son we talk about uh, the subsequent stories, especially the Lazarus and, and the rich man, okay. and how that shed light on the prodigal son. Yeah. Because it's all within the same... Um, yeah, yeah. Scholars call it pericope, I just call it the story form, yeah, yeah. where it starts and where it ends. Yeah. Um, I can hear what you're saying, but I'm also thinking, and I can certainly see that from the book, definitely it, it does would transfer it to the Old Testament. But from what I see, and my danger is Old Testament as well. And so maybe if you can get a young guy like Kelvin Chong to translate it for you, uh, your Old Testament ones from Chinese to English, I'd be interested in that. I know you've got a lot of projects on, but uh, yeah, I'd be, I, I'm, great passages in here, um, great topics, um, but yeah, I don't well, know. Old Testament is challenging. Yeah. You know, it's challenging in a way that, because the formation of the text of the Old Testament took a longer time, and Hebrew language evolved quite late, the text that we have right now. So it has its own complications. I think those complications do not need to go up on the pulpit. <laughs> yeah. We don't need to share them because it's just way too complicated. Yeah. But they do, um, these complications do shape our sermon form and how we apply them. And, and seminary, how we learn. Well, I'm loving to hear that. I think it's brilliant to have a, um, your teaching at a scholarly level New Testament and your teaching preachers that what you teach isn't staying in the seminary because what you're teaching, you're actually taking them through the preaching process as well. Um, as you said, a lot of the scholarly things doesn't need to transfer, you don't need to say it in the pulpit. That's right. But um, I guess through this, through what you've written here, uh, and through your uh, homiletics class, what do you foresee what do you see is the effect of people actually using this method helpfully um, and bringing, thinking through the text clearly, thinking through the context clearly, and then preaching that? What do you see the effect of that in our churches? In contrast to what we were talking about before about the, the neo-evangelical. Mm. What do you see the effect of this book being? Or what, what's your prayer for the effect of this book being through our churches? My prayer would be that people would take the Bible seriously. It's really that simple. Not, not taking what I think the Bible seriously, but thinking through, uh, putting down a lot of our own prejudices and trying to understand what the Bible actually says. I, I have this sort of method that I, I give my students sometimes. I, I would talk through the text as if the wrong interpretation is right, and lead us to 
the consequence of that. And I would say, you know, Jesus is really not saying that. Yeah. And people get shocked, like, of course Jesus wouldn't, wouldn't say that, but <laughs> this is what we believe in church. Do, do you set them up for that? Do you actually do tell actually. them that you're doing this, or do you actually do, do I just do it. You just do it. I just do it, and then and, and people remember my sermons yeah. because of that. I, I, I thought it's, um, well, I still think it's a, it's a helpful rhetorical tap. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do is to show them what the text actually does as much as what the text actually yeah. says. Yeah. And what we actually do to the text and the consequence of what we do to the text. Yeah. And I think we need to take that seriously because these things have spiritual implications. Yeah. And they impact our lives directly. Yeah. And they impact the lives of the people whom we disciple directly. Yeah. And we're dealing with lives, so we're not just dealing with scholarly and work. And, and generations, because they're the people who teach our Sunday school and yes. youth. And yes. I remember the principal of the Bible college I went to, David Cook, uh, when he was teaching us pr uh, principles of preaching and application, one of the things he'd always say is uh, he finished his sermons with three points. What's the necessary point of application? What you have to do? What possible? This is what some of you might have to deal with and what's the impossible? And he said he'd always say that a lot of people, no, there's not quite a few people in the congregation who are living in line with what the text doesn't say. Mm. Uh, who are and so you need to say to people, this is what you can't do. And so it sounds very similar. He'd say, you, you, look, what you can't do from this passage is this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of you are doing this, or some of you might be doing this. Um, how would, it's really hard to change. Well, once you've been in a cycle as a preacher and as a teacher for a number of years, uh, and, you're, and also you're getting like, positive feedback, for people in your church, if you've been preaching, uh, just um, going on to felt needs or so forth from a passage and ignoring the context, how would you go about changing? Because if you are getting good feedback and you're in a routine, it's so hard to get out of that. I think I think I think we have to look at it from a spirituality point of view. To me, it is not at the end of the day about the scholarly. Acumen. It is really about our character as ministers, or myself as a specialist in whatever field I write in. I think we have to think about, we as Christians need to grow. Yeah. We, we, don't, we don't come on a pulpit to get the accolades of our people. We, we serve... Well, sometimes we do. Yes, but, unfortunately. Yeah. But we serve a big boss. And our boss is so much bigger than who we are. And we don't grow in our spiritual lives, in our intellectual lives. Yeah. We, we are shortchanging our very office that, to which we are called. Yeah. And that's, that's how seriously I take it. So, so what I see sermons in reality, mm -hmm. in, in realistic terms, would be conversation starters. After I preach a sermon, some people say, oh, I don't feel comfortable with that. I say, well, let's sit down and talk. That's where the pastoral moment comes in. Yeah. You know, I always welcome feedback, even negative feedback, so that I have a chance to, to bridge that gap for you, because every person listens to a sermon slightly differently. Yeah. Right? Not everyone hears the same thing. Yeah. And that has to do with people's background. Sometimes it has nothing to do with the preacher, and we don't have to put the whole responsibility on ourselves. But at the same time, we have to help people, really. We, we're there to pastor them. And we pastor them through our sermons, and I think we pastor them after our sermons. Yes. And I see sermons as uh, pastoral opportunities, and we create those opportunities if we preach it. And I have nothing against felt need sermons. Yeah. I think scripture can speak to our felt needs, but it has yeah. to be the right scripture text. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. Absolutely. 